This is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of January 24th, 2022. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.25 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, also on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, why we aren't concerned about including a portion of the COVID federal relief funds as part of unrestricted general funds in this budget. Second, we explain why we increasingly believe Governor Dunleavy has become a fiscal wimp. And third, following up on some recent discussions of the issue in Senate finance, we explore whether there are better ways to smooth oil revenues over budget cycles. And now, let's join Michael. Well, Brad, let's um, let's dive into it today uh, on the weekly top three. The number one thing that uh, you wanted to talk about, which kind of raised my eyebrows when I read your topic list that you sent me, was um, you're like the federal money's being accounted for in this year. Uh, that's that. It's not necessarily bad. In fact, it's encouraging, and and you support that idea for, I guess, just for this year, or maybe you can explain it to us. But why are all these federal dollars? Why is it a good thing to include them in the budget? Let's start. Uh, let's start there this morning. Well, this is the second year of COVID money being available uh, to the state, uh, and and being available for various uses. One of the uses uh, that the state can put COVID money to is revenue replacement. Um, and the governor has proposed to do that. He's taken a substantial portion of the COVID money, about $375 million uh, in COVID money, and put it into uh, directly into the budget as revenue replacement, treated it as UGF, uh, and it's going to pay for the UGF, UGF budget. Now, this is not something you can do on, an, on a continuing basis because it's one-time COVID money uh, that came out of... Uh, uh, I forget which uh, which COVID relief bill it came out of. But one of the two, right? Came, came, I'm sorry? One of the two, right? It just yeah. come, came out of one of the two bills. Um, and uh, and it's not it's not going to be an ongoing thing, but it is available. It is available this year. It has it has thus far been a bit of a uh, contentious issue at the legislature uh, that the governor's done it because uh Bryce, Edgman, and others have raised the issue of, well, it's not going to be available long term. Why are you putting it in the budget? Uh, it's distorting, uh, distorting the budget, and uh, and uh, uh, you know, it 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 it's something that uh, wouldn't be there in subsequent years, and so there'll be a hole in the budget in, in subsequent years if uh, if you count it uh, this year. Let me t- let me tell you what the what, uh, others before you get there. Others have said. Uh, oh, we ought to be somehow saving that money. We ought to be uh, uh, redirecting an equivalent amount. Put that in the budget. That's fine. But we ought to be redirecting an equivalent amount uh, into uh, uh, the CBR or the SBR, wherever it goes, uh, and uh, and saving that money for future generations. Let me let me tell you what's going on with the with the federal money coming into the budget. It's popping up as additional PFD. If you didn't put that money uh, into the three hundred seventy five million dollars into the budget, budget would otherwise be closed, not through spending cuts, because the governor hasn't proposed that, and there really aren't any legislators who are talking about that, or not a sufficient majority talking about that to, to close it that way. If if the $375 million wasn't in UGF, they would be closing it uh, through uh, additional PFD draws uh, or PFD cuts. So, and that's about, what is that, about $500 million plus or minus, or $500 plus or minus per PFD. 
So that federal money is is enabling the governor in his budget proposal uh, to uh, propose uh, additional uh, PFDs over and above what he otherwise, given given the way he's been budgeting to this point, what otherwise would be proposed out there. Those who want to take the federal money, I mean, there's a there's there's a variety of proposals out there. Some want to take the federal money. Uh, that $375 million and do it in grants to specific additional uh, programs. The governor's done some of that. I think there's about 170, 150 to $175 million that he's taken of additional COVID relief money and put out there as uh, as grants to, to specific programs. Um, and some want to take that 370, the additional amount, $375 million and do that as grants to communities or to organizations or right. or otherwise and put it out there uh, in additional grants. But they've got to close, if they do that, if the legislature were to do that, they'd have to close uh, the budget gap that creates and they would close it through PFD cuts. So I think, uh, it, you know, it, it's a, it's a one-year deal. Uh, typically, I don't like uh, one-year deals because you then have to confront what you're going to do about that about that revenue gap or about that gap uh, in subsequent years, uh, but in this case, uh, I think it's a good it's a good use of the money and a good use of uh, of, of creating the opportunity for uh, for additional PFDs. So you're saying that this is not a bunch of drunken monkeys putting the budget together, as quoted by by uh, finance co-chair Bert Stedman. Not a bunch of drunken monkeys. Uh, what do you say, what do you say to people who because uh, I've seen a lot of speculation that oh this is Dunleavy in his election year thing he's trying to show that he can get the the PFDs and everything else again but I mean does it matter at that point if it's an election year stunt or not if people get their PFDs? Uh, not really. I mean, what, it's one time money. It's uh, it, it comes from the federal government. I suppose we could give it back. Uh, but we're not going to do that. So it's one-time money. So what are we? What are you going to do with it? You've got a lot of groups out there who would say, "Oh, we'll take that off your hands. Don't worry about it. We can use it for this project or that project or you know some other uh, uh, do good thing." But then you then you have created a bunch of new programs that people are going to come back in subsequent legislatures and say, "Oh, well, you gave us the seed money from the federal money, but this program has really proven itself." And so you need to you need to put us on the renewal. You need to give right. us additional right. additional money in future in future periods. So you don't want to do that because uh, you're just creating more constituencies for additional government programs uh, out there in the future. Um, it's it it is it is money that's got to be used, or it's money that will be used in some fashion. It expires if you don't use it uh, by a certain period of time. So I think it's a I think it's a good thing to put it in this year's budget. Uh, as as a uh, as a as a as a revenue source, uh, and as I say, pop out PFDs. Yes, it's an election year. Yes, it probably does benefit the governor to some marginal extent, but it benefits Alaskans by getting more PFD um, uh, in their hands. And, right. You know, good, bad, or indifferent. I think that's a good thing. Right. Uh, uh, to have a to have those additional dollars in Alaskans' hands. Uh, as opposed to uh, as opposed to going out for some other use. Well, sure, individual Alaskans benefit, and the overall Alaska economy will benefit as well. So, I mean, yeah, but it's, if it's a win-win-win, I'm okay with that. Uh, but isn't it a picture perfect example, like you were saying, where they're saying, "Oh, we'd like to take this money and disperse it to, you know, X, Y, and Z." Isn't that the perfect example of all these people deciding? Uh, you know, where best to spend your money, where best to put the thing, where, be, you know, picking the winners and losers and, oh, is it the people that I know that run this program or is it the, you know, talk about politicizing all this money. That's what it's all about when it comes down to it. Yeah, exactly right. And some people say, oh, we can put it to jobs. You know, we can, we can, uh, we can put it in, uh, in, in people's pockets through, uh, you know, creating additional programs and thus, uh, and thus additional employment. Well, it's jobs if you put it in the pockets of, of individual Alaskans through, uh, uh, through PFDs. Uh, I mean, individual Alaskans spend that money. It creates a, a knock on effect, uh, in the economy as well as helping individual Alaskans. It creates a knock on effect, uh, in the economy when, uh, when they spend it. So, you know, it, it's, it's, it's government. It's, 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 you know, the 61 down there, the 60 legislators plus the governor, if they, if they want to divert it per, to programs saying, it's the jobs I want. You know, I get to pick 
you know, where I spend this money and it's the jobs I want to create as opposed to the jobs that Alaskans want to create. Yeah. So I, it, it, to me, it makes a lot of sense uh, 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 to, to put it into the general fund. Frankly, if we were going to have a debate about this, I would probably, I would argue that the additional money, the additional 150 to $175 million that the, that the governor's putting out in specific programs should be used as revenue replacement as well. Right. Uh, and, and, and put it into the general fund as well, as opposed to putting it out in those additional programs. But I, $350 million, uh, $375 million rather, uh, is a pretty good, uh, is a pretty good contribution, uh, of a pretty good use of those, uh, of that federal money. And, uh, and one that, that I think, uh, uh, I hope, uh, uh, maintains, uh, through, uh, through the course of the legislature. Donna Erdwin's in the chat room and she said the governor of the legislature had over a billion dollars in fund money last year and they still cut your dividends. And so while the I mean, while the argument is this federal money is going to offset a lot of it, I mean, they've had money in the past and they've just made this poor choice over and over and over again. I mean, is this is this more hopefulness than anything else or what? what is your thought on that? Well, they have made poor choices in the past. I mean, if we're if we're going to spend, there are better ways to raise revenues than 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 PFD cuts. I mean, as as ICER has told us, as ITEP has told us, uh, cutting the PFD has the largest adverse impact on the overall Alaska economy. It's worse for eighty percent of Alaska families than than any other option, any other revenue option. So it, it is it's a continuing uh, uh, poor choice. Um, and, 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 but, but we're faced with, you know, we're faced with the prospect that that's the choice that the legislate, that's the choice that governor Walker uh, made uh, uh, back in 2006 It's the choice the legislature has made uh, uh, in subsequent, uh, subsequent years. Uh, and it's now the choice that Dunleavy's making. I mean, I, I can't, I can't describe the level of surprise and shock and disappointment uh, that I have in in Dunleavy for for in this budget for adopting POMB 5050 without even having the guts to tell Alaskans this is what I'm doing I'm cutting your PFD by a billion dollars this year um, uh, in order to uh, in order to balance my budget I mean the governor goes around in response to uh, uh, Charlie Pierce's uh, announcement of uh, that he was running for governor. Uh, Andrew Jensen, on behalf of the campaign, put out a press release that said, uh, well, this governor has, among other things, you know, is, is proposing a surplus budget this year. He's got the budget under control. <laughs> he's proposing it's a surplus budget because because he's cutting a billion dollars uh, uh, from the PFD and diverting it to government. Right. Um, and he's not even telling Alaskans that's what he's doing. I mean, it's. It's it's like uh, it's well, like this stealth stealth tax. Well, he, this governor has had a messaging problem from the very beginning. I mean, I just I, I you know, it's it's astonishing to me with the number of people that he's pulled into his administration who deal uh, who were media and he's got talk radio show hosts and everything else in his administration. And it still is amazing to me that this governor has had a communication problem with the public from day one almost and it's just never gotten better he's never been able to get his message out there to get ahead of it and to try and and at least attempt to to control the narrative at all it's just it's you know like you said he just does stuff without really telling you and then that is that is such a typical Politico reaction of, oh, look, he's got a surplus budget. Well, only if you move the shells in a certain direction does he have a surplus budget. It's more of that same kind of voodoo economics that we've talked about in the past, uh, the same type of shell games that other governors have played. Oh, look, we cut the budget. No, we cut the increase to the budget. The budget's still going up. The net increase, it's still going up, you know, 12%. But we cut the increase, so we cut the budget. I mean, it's the same kind of Pushwa BS that we see. I'm sorry, the same Pushwa Bert Stedman that we've seen in every one of these things as we go forward. I mean, it's it's a disease at this point. Well, it, it, it's something, Michael. I mean, it's gone from a messaging problem to a substantive problem. I mean, now we've got a billion. We got this governor proposing a billion dollars in PFD cuts from the statutory PFD down to POMV fifty fifty. It's seven hundred million dollars a year, averaged over the next. Uh, over the next 10 years, according to the budgets, according to the administration's uh, 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 10 year plan. And, and that's, I mean, that's what this governor who ran on preserving the PFD 
uh, in 2018. That's what this governor uh, has has now resorted to. And it's just, I mean, things like things like the gambling initiative. Yeah, okay, so gambling is a tax on on the stupid. Yes, it is. But it but it generates revenue. And the administration itself was the one who raised gambling. Um, uh, it's, and, and now, and now, and now they evidently have abandoned it, uh, in favor in, instead going to, uh, going to PFD cuts to, uh, uh, to fund the government, uh, go, go fund the government instead. So it's just, I mean, it's a, it's a disappointment, uh, across the board. Uh, yes, Donna is, is correct. There was more that he could have done uh, last year, uh, but they gave a lot of that COVID money out in, uh, in grants, uh, at least, they're diverting 375 million of it to essentially uh, Alaska citizens through PFDs through preserving that portion of the PFD uh, this year. Well, and at least, I mean, especially looking at what the pandemic has done to the private economy. I mean, you know, on top of all that, the fact that, you know, we're still struggling, we were coming out of a recession, things just, you know, has not gotten better since the beginning of the pandemic. And if there was ever a time to do a little rainy day money, if there was ever a time to get that money into the hands of the private economy, especially money that's owed, now would be the time to do it. And that is the, I guess that's the most disappointing thing to me at this point. Ryan says, I always thought Brad was anti-PFD. And, and I'm just like, <laughs> what? Uh, you know, and, and then somebody else says, well, what do you expect? He worked for big oil. I mean, Brad, if you've listened to this program for longer than three and a half seconds with Brad on the program for the last eight years, seven years, eight years, Brad, you have always been pro PFD. You've always talked about how the PFD tax is the largest, has the largest adverse impact on Alaska families in the economy. It should be a full statutory PFD. You've been pushing it, but I, people hear what they want to hear. I swear to God, people just do not hear what they, you know, they hear one thing they don't agree with on you. And then immediately everything you say must be uh, at the antithesis of what they believe. Brad, um, are you anti-PFD? I should put that out there just just to make sure you can clear your name on this or something. No, I'm, I've 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 always been since we started this in 2013. <laughs> 13, 14, I, yeah. I've always been uh, uh, I've always been uh, pro PFD. Everything I've written, I've geez, not only have they not listened to me uh, on on the program, they've not read anything that I've read. I put out a daily to the to the point that it it really bugs some people. I put out every day uh, a, a short blurb that I call the the daily today's uh, PFD note, and it's a uh, it's why the PFD is important. It's why we need to preserve the PFD. It's even to the point of we need to adopt substitute revenues uh, in order to to fund government in order to preserve the PFD. I just I. It's hard to imagine how somebody has listened to, as you say, more than three seconds of anything I've said and say that I'm anti-PFD. Yeah, no, it's uh, reading is fundamental at this point uh, or just listening is fundamental, uh, you know, to it. But this is, you know, and I think this is part of the problem of what we have um uh, this is part of the problem we have in America today is that people, they hear one thing that they may not 100 percent agree with and then everything goes out with the bathwater. There's no there's no discernment um, in listening to something. Like I said, uh, I don't always agree with Brad. Um, and yet he always brings good information to the table that gives me more things to think about. Why should I throw everything out? Because he and I disagree on one or two points or something. Why would I not? People say, why do you keep bringing him back? Well, because I find it interesting to look at some of these things, whether we agree or not. I mean, I don't want a tax. I definitely don't want a tax. I want to fix what's broken in this state. Uh, does that mean that we should, uh, uh, you know, does that mean that we should ignore the fact that there could be a potential tax on the horizon? No. And if we're going to do that, then we should talk about the best kind of tax there is. But, but, but Michael, we've got, I mean, I, I, we've got a tax. PFD cuts it's, it's are true. a tax. I mean, it's true. They are a tax on middle and lower income Alaska families. We have had them since 2017. They're going to continue into the future. The question isn't whether we're going to be taxed. The question is how we're going to be taxed. And there's a lot better ways, a lot more efficient, a lot lower adverse impact on the economy, a lot more equitable ways of doing it than PFD cuts. Yeah, no, absolutely. And you're 100% right, Brad. You're 100%. You and I agree 100% on that. Um, I, you know, like I said, I don't want to see any other form of tax 
on top of this. And I want to fix the taxes that we have right now, which is the PFD tax, because it is adversely affecting us more than anything else. Uh, Donna just said, y'all have a $15,000 per capita tax. Have a nice day. <laughs> you know, kind of thing. I mean, it's already happening. Uh, it's the stealth tax in Alaska because we never see that money. It never goes through our hands. And, and the point is the governor is now taxing us, right? I mean, the governor is now using PFD taxes, uh, as, uh, as, as part of his fiscal plan, no right. gambling, no sales taxes, nothing, uh, along the lines, no Hill Corp fix, nothing along the lines that his own Department of Revenue uh, outlined as as options uh, in November. None of that. Right. He's using, but he's using the PFD tax, the thing that falls hardest on middle and lower income Alaska families, the thing that has the largest adverse impact, the approach that has the largest adverse impact on the overall Alaska economy. Even the governor, even Governor Dunleavy has now bought into, right. we're going to tax Alaska. Chris in uh, Chris on the Twitch channel says, has Brad considered taxing us through fewer government services? Again, just go back and listen to the re replays of the show. We've talked about that, and we would all love to see that, but I think Brad and I agree at this point that the possibility, the, the legitimate reality of that actually happening because of the political will is almost Zero, because you, you've got a handful of politicians who are fighting for that restructuring and restricting and, and, and reducing government. And the rest of them are like, make it rain. Just make it rain. Put that money out there. Right, Brett? Exactly right. I mean, we, we, we hit that in 2019, right? I mean, the governor tried to give the governor credit. He tried that in 2019 and he couldn't even get 16 to back him up on the level of cuts it took. To, to, to balance the budget uh, without uh, without some form of additional revenue. I mean, even, even the most conservative were coming to the governor saying, cut everything else, but just don't cut this little program. Not and in my you, backyard, yeah. And when you multiple that, multiply that by 60 legislators, you don't get cuts. Yeah. Um, and, that's, uh, and that's where we are. And in what this governor is doing instead, instead of finding an equitable revenue source to deal with to deal with the situation we're in, he's now bought into, we have to do it through PFD cuts. We have to take it <laughs> on the backs of middle and lower income Alaska families. I think Jeremy may be right. He said, the reality is they're going to take your PFD and tax your ass on top of it. And I, I mean, unfortunately that is, you know, if history is any guide, that could definitely be the way we're going. But let's get into number two. Uh, we got about four or five minutes here before we got to go to break. So let's at least start with the number two. And uh, you use the term wimpy which I thought was kind of uh, that, that was kind of descriptive. Uh, is the governor wimping out on the budget uh, when he's talking about new revenues? I mean, the governor had proposed several different kinds of new revenues. I know taxes were thrown around there and everything else. But one of them was the gaming, uh, a potential for new gaming stuff to happen. And uh, it looks like he has uh, looks like he's maybe pulled back on that. Give us your thoughts on whether or not the governor's wimping out. Well, one of the early one of the uh, uh, things that the Department of Revenue Commissioner uh, Lucinda Mahoney talked about last fall, uh, when she addressed the working group, uh, was a proposal that uh, that the governor was thinking about a gaming uh, bill, bringing a gaming bill to the legislature, um, and the gaming bill uh, was projected uh, didn't have good projections at the time in terms of revenue. Uh, subsequently. The Department of Revenue in uh, in the November fiscal model that it put out projected 65 million the first couple of years and 140 some odd million I think um, in uh, in subsequent years of, of potential from gaming re gaming revenue. It was it was a specific example. I mean, when she talked about it last fall, it was a specific example of something that the governor was was moving on had 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 let a contract. Uh, uh, to you know, bring in an expert to talk about how to put together a gaming, a gaming uh, state gaming proposition, um, and it was a specific example of something that the legislature that the administration was moving forward on. Uh, subsequently, uh, the contract was let. It was a five hundred thousand dollar contract to go out and find an expert to put together a proposal. Uh, the contract was fulfilled. The administration received the benefits of the of the contract. Got a proposal, um, but hadn't. But we hadn't heard anything from it. Uh, in the governor's press conference last week, Jeff Landfield of the uh, 
the Alaska landmine asked the asked the governor during the press conference, what about the gaming proposal? What was going to come out uh, from the gaming proposal? The governor dodged it at the time, saying that uh, uh, that you know the uh, report would subsequently be provided uh, to the press. It was the next day, uh, and so the press and 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 it's been made available, and you can go see the gaming report now. It's a substantial report, uh, as it should be for five hundred for a five hundred thousand dollar contract. Uh, but here's what Landfield said on Sunday: uh, sources inform political report inform a land, Landfield that Dunleavy is no longer planning on introducing a gaming bill due to pressure from the charitable gaming industry and the religious community. So we've gone out, the administration has gone out, spent $500,000 to get a gaming package. It was a big deal last fall when the Department of Revenue was talking about it. It's not, you know, small bucks, uh, $65 million in terms of additional revenue, be a $100 PFD, 140 is roughly $200 per PFD of replacement revenue, substitute revenue that you could uh, that you could uh, put into the budget and uh, and reduce the pressure on uh, on PFD cuts, PFD taxes. Uh, but the administration uh, isn't even pursuing that. I mean, we went we went through a list uh, a couple of weeks ago on the program of all of the options that Department of Revenue had included in its fiscal model and all of the numbers. The Hillcorp uh, uh, problem, uh, uh, bringing corporate taxes on on uh, online companies doing business in the state, uh, a number of options, one of which was gaming, and the governor's not even doing that after going through this whole process uh, last year. So, you know, you got to question what the governor's up to um, uh, at some point, uh, whether he has the guts to go through on the on the the revenue side to develop these substitute revenues to reduce the pressure on PFD cuts. I mean, the governor in this budget proposes 700, well, a billion dollars this coming fiscal year in PFD cuts, moving from the statutory PFD down to uh, down to POMV 50-50. That's a billion dollars in PFD cuts. It looks like, looks like that's what the governor's going, that's the governor's go-to now, PFD right. cuts, as opposed to these alternative revenues. Do this, uh, do this revenue report, or excuse me, does this gaming report, does it talk about potential revenues and what it could bring? I mean, is there a, is there a deeper fiscal analysis? How much money are we talking about here? Well, as I said, $65 million for the first couple of years and $140 million uh, uh, in subsequent years. So that's, you know, it's a hundred, it's a, uh, $65 million is roughly a hundred dollars of PFD. $140 million is roughly 200, a little, little bit over 200 dollars a, a pfd so it's not it's not chicken feed right no and as we, many people have said that kind of gambling stuff is a tax on the stupid so i mean you know it, it, it you you get what you pay at least it's a voluntary tax at that point right at least you're volunteering to drop your paycheck in something like that so i definitely uh, definitely feel that back uh we're finishing up with uh uh our second uh of the weekly top three we're going to get all three in today it looks like so I want to finish up uh, with this, Brad. You were talking about, and, and number two, by the way, for folks out there, was the fact that the governor appears to have, uh, well, wimped out and pulled back. He spent $500,000 on a very highly specialized, detailed report on how the gaming industry could be set up in the state of Alaska to help generate revenue, eventually generating $100, $140 million a year in revenue over the next uh, few years, every year. Uh, which is, you know, in a multi-billion dollar budget may not seem like much, but every little bit helps. You're talking about $100, $200 to every PFD if that money was uh, was factored in. Um, but, I mean, this is the problem, Brad. We we look at any other voluntary form of taxation. You want to call, if you want to call a gaming tax, it's a voluntary tax. People are paying it willingly, you know, uh, user taxes, uh, user fees, all these other things that could be done. I mean, if we don't keep pushing in those directions for the voluntary things, it's not too long before we'll be looking at involuntary taxes because this place can't control their spending. I have involuntary taxes, Michael. I'm sorry. That's, say, that's what you said. What you, said, I, I, you were cut off there at the beginning. What? I, we already have involuntary taxes. Well, true. That's what that's, that's what PFD cuts are. Well, it's true. I mean, you are 100 percent true. But instead of trying to find a way to eliminate the involuntary taxes, it seems like we just we just keep going in the same direction. Yeah. Here, here, here's the here's the deal that that is that's so disappointing with respect to with respect to the these gaming the gaming issue. 
this this is a proposal the governor put forward to to have gaming revenues is a proposal the governor put forward last fall in response to you know questions about how they were going to close close the fiscal gap it's a it's a study that the governor had done it's a report the governor had paid for the administration paid for uh, it's a study that was done and uh, and delivered to the administration and now you could you knew there was going to be pushback from some point you knew there was going to be pushback from charitable gaming because because they were going to view it as a threat to their business you knew there was going to be issues with the religious community now that he's got the report now that he's got the study now that he's got everything he needs to be able to to put a package in front of the legislature now he's going to give up on it because he's getting pushback from people that you knew from the beginning you were going to get uh, you were going to get pushback from um and and rather than you know when Rather than take that into account when he when he got ready to uh, when he got ready to put that package out there, rather than take it into account, he's he's folding his he's folding folding his his hand, not not pushing it forward, and instead taking that money out of the PFD, instead taking uh, you know cutting the PFD by a uh, billion dollars this year, seven hundred million dollars per year over the next uh, over the next ten years. It's not like it's not like he's saying, okay, well we don't need the revenue. Um, and you know we're going to find cuts, or we're going to do other things. We don't need that revenue. He's saying we need the revenue. It's just that we're going to take it out of the PFD as opposed to you know follow through on this on this one proposal uh, that they made out there to uh, to pursue uh, uh, gaming revenues. It's uh, it's frustrating. It's frustrating to watch for sure. Um, let's uh, move on to number three. Number three is. A new way to factor the budgets that take into account oil revenues in a new and better way. Uh, what's 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 your thoughts on this, Brad? So, Senator Stedman, uh, in the course of one of the Senate finance hearings uh, that we've had thus far, uh, was pushing back on the administration about oil revenues. Oil revenues have gone up so much. Uh, uh, this past year, they're they're projected to go up so much this past year, uh, and then carry over into the next fiscal year, that they're carrying a substantial amount of the budget. Uh, we don't need uh, to be talking about as much in PFD cuts uh, uh, in the next two fiscal years as as we otherwise had previously been talking about, because oil revenues are up. Um, so sort of sort of consistent with the same approach of never look ne never except a gift horse. Um, uh, Senator Stedman is now pushing back on, on oil revenues uh, and saying, well, you know, we, we got to be careful about this surge in oil revenues. Uh, it may not be a lasting thing. And indeed, the futures market tells us it's not a lasting thing, uh, but at least it's there for a couple of years. Right. Pushing back on it and he's saying, well, maybe we ought to, maybe we ought to look at a different way of, of calculating uh, oil revenues uh, in a way that is that that provides a more stable approach, a more consistent approach, a more level approach to uh, to oil revenues over time, as opposed to this oil revenues go up and uh, and oil revenues go down. Wow, that sounds real familiar, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it's some, it's something that frankly we've talked, you and I have talked about on the show before, in the context of a spending cap. Right. I mean, how do you how do you calculate a spending cap? Well. You take revenues from a prior period um, that you know you've got the revenues from, and you calculate a spending cap going forward based on those revenues, and you adjust on a on a on a on a gradual basis. You take a rolling average, a three-year rolling average, or a four-year rolling average, or you know whatever whatever period of time you want to use in this rolling average. You adjust it gradually. It's the same way we're doing. Uh, uh, with revenues from uh, from the permanent fund, the permanent fund earnings, we're we're averaging those over a period of time, uh, and you do the same thing with oil revenues. Uh, but that is that's something we've discussed in conjunction with a spending cap, and it makes sense in conjunction with a with a spending cap. What I think uh, what I think Senator Stedman wants to do is reduce uh, the level of oil revenues that we're using to support the budget in this year and next year when oil revenues are up. What does that, what does that mean? It means increased PFD cuts, right? Because again, nobody's talking about cutting spending. So you've got to get the revenues from someplace. The only revenues that, that, that people have talked about it coming from uh, is through additional PFD cuts. 
you take it from PFD cuts, and then you've got then then you've got the savings that you can use uh, in subsequent periods uh, potentially, uh, or if, if it's not consumed with, uh, with increased spending in, in subsequent periods. So I think, I think, uh, uh, smoothing oil revenues, uh, makes sense as long as you're doing it in conjunction with, uh, a spending cap. If you're not doing it in conjunction with a spending cap, uh, you're not really saving anything. You're just storing away money that can be blown, uh, in future periods. Um, and and you're cutting PFDs, uh, cutting PFDs in the meantime. So, I, Stedman may be on to something, but but what he's on to is something that leads ultimately to a spending cap. He's not on to something that uh, that makes sense uh, outside of a spending. Well, cap. that could, could may have a spending cap, but like you said, I don't think he's interested in the spending cap portion of it. He wants to capture more of those dollars. And again, that's a way to do it by taking the PFD. I mean, we've talked about this. That's actually number four on the charter of changes, right? Changing the way we budget and smoothing the budget by working on past revenues and taking a look at it and an average of it. And, and you know, I had proposed, again, the same kind of thing, a five-year rolling average and, and looking at it. The problem is, as you point out, the problem with that point of the charter of changes is if we did that, if we said the budget can be no more... Uh, you know, plus or minus 5% of a five-year rolling average of our last five years of revenues and everything else, uh, without a commitment to reduce the size and scope of government, what will eventually happen with something like that is that it will consume all of the PFD. I mean, that just because they will just, everything will grow and they'll just consume all of the PFD. And maybe that's what it takes for Alaskans to wake up. I don't know. I don't know how to get more Alaskans engaged in this. 60 seconds, Brad, your final thoughts here. Well, it's uh, talking about talking about uh, uh, smoothing out uh, oil revenues is a good thing, but it's, but it needs to be in the context of uh, uh, of, uh, of a spending cap as opposed to just smoothing it out, taking that money and putting it into future years, and then just continuing to build up government because oh, we've got the revenue, we've got we've got savings we can blow through uh, uh, in future years. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Look at that, Brad. We made it all the way through all three today. That was pretty amazing. Good stuff. I appreciate you coming on board. Um, May we live in interesting times? I think that's pretty much a a given at this point. It's going to be an interesting year. We look forward to more of your analysis next week. Thank you for coming on board. Michael, as always, thanks for having me. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, and keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.